Assignment 103 is to do a either an architecture lecture series or an industrial design lecture series, your choice. And the idea is that you're picking uh, a group of influential designers that are going to come and speak to you guys uh, about certain design topics. Uh, you're more than welcome to use a pre-existing lecture series, i.e. like the architecture lecture series that the ACE Club is putting on, right? Or you can invent your own lecture series of people that are coming. I've had people do lecture series of all like past dead architects that came back from the living, you know, came back from the dead to, to give lectures or whatever. So you can get creative about it. That's fine. So in terms of the content, I'm not overly worried about it. This is really about how do you invite or entice people to come to this lecture series. So how do you create a poster that is the kind of thing that is drawing people to want to see that or is visually interesting, draws attention that sort of thing. That's what we're after in this. Uh, frequently, the people who do really well on this assignment end up doing the lecture series posters for the following semesters. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to see that happen. So um, I have a couple examples down on the bottom. There's a bunch of examples online uh, of previous ones. I've done this assignment for a very long time. I haven't modified it because I think it's a very good one. Uh, there's a lot of uh, content to try to figure out how to arrange and there's a lot of different ways of arranging it. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how you come up with what your composition is going to be. Um, so I like it. I think it's a really good test uh, of your InDesign abilities. Today, in the exercise that you're going to be working on, you're kind of doing a tester for it. I give, it, I give you a, a different size format. It's like a postcard instead of the full 11 by 17. Um, so you kind of have a, a preview of, of working through, thinking through your ideas and that sort of thing. So um, you, have, you have time to kind of work through that. So that should be about everything. Don't steal somebody else's artwork. Uh, I've, I've only had this happen once um, where I had somebody borrow, steals probably a little bit strong of a term, uh, borrow somebody's graphics for their poster. And I actually got an email from the person who owns the graphic saying, could you please have that student take that down because it's copywritten and I don't want it used or whatever. So use your own or find Creative Commons license stuff to use and then attribute it. Put a little note on the bottom of where it came from. That's fine with me. Um, so this is really, it's about text. It's about composition. It's about how do you create hierarchy. All the stuff that, shockingly, we're going to talk about today. Okay? So we're going to move on and we're going to start talking about uh, what I consider to be my Graphic Design 2 lecture. So it builds on uh, the graphic design one, which was about intuition and, and kind of cultivating your design inspiration, et cetera. Uh, last class, we talked all about typography and fonts and font choice. And today, we're going to bring those two things together into a truth like structure organization graphic design lecture about how do we, how do we really set this stuff up into a, a format that is uh, readable and legible and exciting to look at, et cetera. So I'm going to start with a discussion of grid systems. And I think grid systems as an underlying um, organizational strategy work really nicely in these kinds of posters. I'm going to show you a bunch of poster examples today as we go through. And I'll, I'll pick them apart, and I'll show you what's working and what's not working. So you have a lot of ideas and a lot of things to think about. So when we start talking about grids, I think it's important to, to talk about some of the main characteristics of grids. Some of these are obvious. Some of them are not so obvious. Uh, but the first thing that I really want to talk about or begin with is the idea of a margin. And so you inherently put a margin on a page, even just intuitively, because when things go all the way off the page, especially if it's text, they feel awkward. Like if you imagine the handout that I gave you today for that assignment, and if you imagine the text going all the way to the edge of the page, such that there was no space on the edge, it would just feel weird. It would say, well, wait a minute, am I missing a few letters? Uh, you know, what's, what's going on? Your brain is not conditioned to work with that. So what the margin does is it directs you, the viewer, into the active area of the page. Hey, this is where the content is. This is where you should be looking. So it's like a little border around it that says to your brain, this is where you should look, and this is where you shouldn't look. And so it's really it's just about that visual cue. It's going to vary in size greatly, depending on the format. You're going to determine what that size should be and what's appropriate. We'll talk about more of that formatting a little bit later on. It is also important that sometimes the margins contain things. So it's not like it's just blank space. It is blank space, but sometimes you put other things in it, like page numbers or uh, footers, headers. Those kinds of things go in that margin space. But we understand visually when we look at it that the main content is inside of the margin and the supplemental content might be in the margin or outside of the margin, i.e. the page number, that sort of thing. So 
no surprise, but the margin is the part that goes around the outside of the page, the part that's highlighted in blue there. The next thing is the idea of a column. And so a column is fundamentally a vertical division of space in the page that's used to align elements. We could have something as simple as one column. You write your English paper or your history paper, it's a one column layout. You have one big block of text, that's it. But we could have multiple columns. If you think about magazines or newspapers, we might end up with lots of little skinny columns. Um, we can divide the page up. Uh, the widths vary according to the function of the design. So English paper, it's going to be that one column. If it's, if it's a magazine where you're trying to squeeze the text down with more images, you might go to multiple columns uh, as they're set up. So here's our columns. All these background images, um, these ones here, are all out of the, uh, the book that I put as a recommended textbook. It's not required for the class. It's the Layout Workbook by Kristen Cullen. Uh, I'll get it out of my office if any of you want to look through it or whatever. Uh, but she does a great job of kind of explaining what, um, what all of these things are. Column intervals, or gutter widths, they're, they're synonymous with each other, is essentially the space between the columns. And if we're going to have columns, we need to have a column interval because you can't have one column collide with another column. And if you think about this, it, just, it makes complete sense. If you had a column of text and the next column of text was right up against it and there was no space between it, you would have no idea where to end one line and the other line. It would get really confusing to read. So we need that visual break between the columns so we have an understanding of, hey, this is one column. We move over. We read the next column. Same thing happens with images. We need that little break between them. They, pre they prevent visual collisions, essentially. So we're not having collisions because of that little break that occurs, and they show up here highlighted in blue. Flow lines are kind of like a column interval, except they're turned horizontally. And so this is a, a horizontal line that breaks up the page that flows through, ideally in a book, that flows through the book. You see it repeated over and over. And you'll see when I do the portfolio lecture and we start talking about portfolios, picking a flow line and having it as a cohesive unit as part of your portfolio can really tie all the pages together nicely. But it's that horizontal alignment point. And so it runs across where those columns would be. You can see that we're forming up a grid. So they're right here. Now in this example, there's three of these flow lines. Sometimes, when you're setting things up, you might only have two li flow lines. You might have one flow line. It might only be at the top. It might only be at the bottom. This is just the ultimate set of options, where we, we have multiple flow lines going down the page. I think the one in the middle is the least effective of all of them. It doesn't really help too much. One, at the one toward the top or one toward the bottom tend to be the more effective use. So if we take the column interval, I guess if we took the column divided by the column interval, divided by the flow lines, we would get what's called a grid module, which is essentially the resulting little space that's defined. The number of modules you're going to have in a design are going to vary greatly, and they're going to be relative to the stuff that you're showing up on the page, the stuff that you're putting on the page. So we're going to vary that size depending on the content. I think this image over here uh, is a particularly nice one because they're showing a lot of things here. We've got a really nice flow line that's running right through here. We've got a nice column interval right here that's separating those two images. This image here is one column width. This image here is two columns wide. The text here is spanning all of those columns. So it's a great use of all of the above. So we're using that grid module, we're using the flow line, we're using the columns, and we're breaking it intelligently as we're showing this uh, overall layout. So this is, um, these are that grid module that I was just talking about. I only highlighted, I skipped a row, because if I highlighted it, it would just look like the columns. But you guys get the idea. I think this image is a pretty intuitive understanding of, of th what the grid module is. Uh, the idea here is that each one of these squares is essentially a grid module. That's a grid module. So one more time, just for review, this is our flow line. This is our column. This is our column. There is a third column here, even though there's no image there. This is our column interval that's running through. 
like that. There would be a column interval that's running through there as well. Make sense from a review? Our margin is the space outside here, down here like that. It's just kind of a summary of everything. So working with basic grids, what's the reason that we set up this grid in the first place? Really, it's about organizing this content in some kind of a cohesive manner. So we have some way that page to page to page, as we lay out a, a graphic piece of work, there's some organization structure behind it. There's some understanding. When you walk into a building, for example, and you see that there's a certain rhythm of columns, you have an understanding of how big the space is, how far it is from one column to the next. You have an understanding of what the building's going to be like because of that structure. It's not something that you point out and say, oh, well, there's a column there and there's a column there. It's just a subconscious thing. I have an idea. The other thing that's great is when suddenly there's a column missing or there's something different, your brain naturally says, oh, something's different about this space. There must be something special about it. So it, it's something that's subconscious, but you as the designer have control of it. So you're now in the driver's seat because of that. It's the underlying structure. We want it to be apparent without being seen. It's an interesting statement. So we want it to be apparent without being seen. The idea is that if you have a good structure behind your work, it feels organized and people that are looking at it concentrate on the work, not on the structure. So that's what I mean here. They're concentrating on the content, not on the structure that's just supporting the content. That's a really important factor, especially in a portfolio. We don't want the portfolio to outshine the work that's in the portfolio. We want the portfolio to support the work that's in the portfolio, so that you're concentrating on that. We're going to compose the visual elements to balance and contrast the shape of the page. So that shape of the page is going to be different depending on what your particular assignment is. In the case of the poster, it's going to be 11 by 17. That's the shape of the page that we're working with. Avoid just an arbitrary grid. And I think this is a big one. Sometimes people just slap a grid on the page and say, hey, I have a grid. I'll work with it. But you really, when you're determining what the size of a grid should be or, or what it should look like, it should be relative to the content that you intend to use. It should be based on the complexity of the elements you're going to be using, not just, hey, here's a grid with a bunch of pictures on it. I think a good example of this is, and I'll talk more about portfolios next class when I give the portfolio lecture, um, but in one of the practice portfolios, I didn't think at the time it was a practice portfolio, but in one of my practice portfolios when I was getting ready to apply to grad school, I did a portfolio. And I had this little tiny grid module that I was working with that I thought was so cool. I had all these little tiny images. Of course, I was on the computer and I had blown them up and I could see all these little tiny images. And I thought this was like the greatest thing in the world. And then I printed it. And then I actually took it to one of my former professors. She said, can you see anything on this page? Like, I'm like, well, yeah, there's all these. Oh, yeah, you really can't see anything because it was too small. The little grid modules were so small that you couldn't tell any details. So it was like, why are all these individual little squares there? So think about how big you really want to show something. How long should a paragraph be? How long should that line be? Should it span from this edge of the board to that edge of the board, or should it be smaller? You have that control, and your grid should reflect that control. So the most simple grid is a single column grid. It's perfect for those large amounts of text that you have, i.e., it's perfect for your history paper. It's perfect for your English paper, because you have a big block of text and a lot of text to get through. You know, think about if you have that, you know, 12 page essay or whatever due in English, it makes a lot of sense to just have a big block of text because there's no images, there's nothing exciting you can even put in. At least with a history paper, you can put some images in, which makes it marginally more interesting. That is why I could never, ever be an English professor. I could not do it. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the other good thing about grad school. When you finally do your thesis and you have to write the 80 page thesis or whatever, you get to put all kinds of pictures in. It's way better to have pictures. Anyway. This single column layout here, this single column grid, is defined only by the margins. We don't have flow lines. We don't have column intervals anymore. We don't have columns for that matter. We just have the single column. It's divided, defined by the margin, the, the area around it. And that tells us what is the active area of the page and what is the inactive area around your content. The margins often need some adjustments in this. So in a typical setup, on our classical setup, um, our sides and bottom tend to be rather large. The top tends to be a little bit smaller. If we have a spread, the inner margin is a little bit less than the outer margin. 
And all you have to do is pick up a book. If you pick up like a paperback book or something, you can see this uh, repeated. Uh, and the po positions tend to be mirrored in a spread. Now this is, of course, if you're making a book. If you're doing an English paper where it's all on one page, then typically the left and the right margins are the same and they would be symmetrical, but the top would be a little bit smaller than the bottom. So there it is, and it's blown up. This is obviously fake text, but you guys get the idea. Don't forget, and I have to throw this in here, because all too often we get stuck on, oh, grid modules and all this stuff. Remember all the compositional techniques we talked about in the photography section. Remember the rule of thirds. Those things still apply. If you were placing your flow line on a page, a great place to put it would be at the, the one-third mark, rule of thirds. So still use those compositional techniques. So I like to put this in here as a caveat, like don't forget what we talked about already because it will help you a great deal. So we can have multiple column grids. So we did the single column grid, the large block of text. A multiple column grid is going to have multiple columns of text. It gives you nearly endless compositional options, and it's suitable for complex projects. You can create some movement or drama or rhythm tension in the overall presentation. So the images that I'm going to be showing you today that are lecture series, this is for a, uh, a lecture series. I think it was Col California College of the Arts did it. Um, and these are all old, old images. And actually, I'm not sure that this one actually is part of that. But I'll show you a bunch of those. But they're all attempting to be lecture series posters. So you'll kind of get these floating around in your head. So as we look at this particular piece, how many columns do you see? Okay, I've got four so far. I've got six. Okay, so it's somewhere in that neighborhood. We can argue, we could debate what the columns really are. I would say this here is one column. We could say that this whole thing is one column depending on your definition. Okay, it could be one, could be, could be not. It's because of that blank space on the left side. Okay, so that would be, let's call it one. Then this here would be column two. This here would be column three. This here would be column four. And this blank space might be column five, depending on how you set it up. Could be margin, could be column. So the point is that we've got a bunch of, uh, of columns here. I'm gonna flip forward and back just to, oh man. I need to figure out on this. I'm still getting used to that. There we go. I wanted to figure, no, it comes back. I don't want it, go away. My old, uh, my old thing had a way of just wiping it when I was done ta talking about it. So, oh well, we're gonna leave it on there for right now. Um, so as we look through it, the other key thing here, I'll switch colors, that'll be a little bit easier, is right there, that would be our flow line across this page. So as we start to look at this poster, between the column, especially this large column here, and the flow line, I should probably switch colors again here. So between this column here and this flow line, we end up with a spot right there that directs you where you're starting in this particular poster. So you have an understanding of where it is should I start reading, what should I look at first, and where should I direct my attention. So we're using that column grid and the flow line to really de define, hey, here's the start. So this is a lecture series, it's the DAAP, whoever that is, and then we start to work our way down into the finer levels of text in here, et cetera. So we have that visual cue of where to start. Modular grids are extensions of the multiple column grids with the addition of horizontal flow lines. Why these are really separate categories, I'm not quite sure. Essentially, as soon as you start putting the column, the multiple column grid in, chances are you're gonna have a flow line in at some point. The result is a page divided into the spatial modules like the image that we saw before. Determining the module sign, size, a couple things to think about. What is the ideal width of a paragraph? So what is a line length? How much text do you wanna have in one line of a paragraph? That's a good way of understanding how small this module should be. If the module is too small and you have one word on every line, it's going to be awkward. So you want to have it, you know, reasonably readable. The other thing to think about is the smallest size of the photograph that you might want to show. So how small do you really want to get? How small is that drawing? How small is that photograph? If it's too small and you can't read it, like the, that first portfolio that I did in grad school, uh, for grad school, it's a bad idea. So we want to make sure that it's big enough to actually see. 
You can, of course, break it. So you could say, hey, the smallest photograph I want to see is two inches by two inches, but the smallest paragraph I want to see is really four inches long. So I'm going to break the small module of two by two with a paragraph that's four inches long. That's certainly doable. So modular grids obviously increase the compositional flexibility a great deal, uh, and they need to be flexible enough to accommodate a variety of content over the course of whatever material it is that you're working with. And so this is one of the big challenges about the portfolio that you're going to do at the end of this semester. You're actually going to start working on it next class. But one of the big challenges related to this is there's so many different things that you're going to have to put in. So thus far this semester, you've done your best photograph, which could have been landscape or portrait. I don't know. It depends for each one of you. Then you went back and you did your uh, combining photographs, Photoshop one which could have been in landscape or portrait, but it's in the same general category. Next assignment I just gave you is an 11 by 17 poster. Well, that's a completely different format than anything you've done so far. A little bit later on in the semester, we're going to work in AutoCAD. We'll end up producing a 24 by 36 sheet. That's, yet again, a completely different size of content. And so you're going to have to figure out how does all this stuff fit in a portfolio with an underlying structure that allows it to be supported without being too obvious or detracting from the content itself. It's one of the biggest challenges of a portfolio of work. So we can, of course, get into the alternate grids. So these are the things where we don't have a standard grid set up. They're usually a little bit more fluid. They're a little bit more loose and organic. They're highly based on intuition. Remember that intuition lecture about how that feels right? That's where you're going to place the objects. You can use the rules of composition, like the rules of thirds, to help you out in this, even if you have an unconventional grid. And they often evolve from a basic grid. So we take the grid apart, we slant it over, we do something to create this um, change in the alternate grid. The visual elements are the ones that define the architecture or the active area of the page. So it's really about the elements themselves. And the compositional structure is based on those visual elements, not on an underlying grid. So this poster here, which I'll blow up, is a great example of one of these layouts. Does this have any columns? No. Does it have any flow lines? No. Is it still an interesting poster? Yeah, it is. So this doesn't have the underlying grid behind it, but it's still a very effective poster. And part of the reason it's really um, effective is that the person who did this layout work thought a lot about strong diagonals. So if we look at the diagonal that's created through these slices in the text, through these planes that are in the background, we see a lot of diagonals going in this direction. Same thing going this way, we see a lot of diagonals kind of working in this direction. Those diagonals all subliminally point us right into this um, space, which is our entry into what it is that we're reading about this. So we're using those elements to direct us into this is an exhibition fashion show. We now have an understanding of what it is, and then we start to work our way around and read the other subliminal text, you know, where it is, what's going on, etc. So it's about those big visual elements directing your attention. And so I would say this is a strong diagonal composition if we go back to the photography section. So it doesn't have the underlying grid, yet it is still very effective. I like these two pages a lot because they have an underlying structure to them. They have an alternate grid structure, but it's not conventional by any means. And I think one of the things that's important as we start to look at is that there's a consistency between these pages. So if we look at this diagonal here, for example, that diagonal appears, right, there, on this page below it. This diagonal here is very similar to this diagonal here. So you see how I'm starting to define what these grids are on the page. The content's different, and what they look like is different. There's a flow line that appears right at the halfway point here. Guess what? That flow line still appears right across that point there. So you guys see how I'm starting to construct what this grid is, the underlying uh, grid. This grid exists on every single page. It's just a little bit unconventional. And there's nothing wrong with this, but it does take a heavy intuitive approach. This looks good versus uh, this doesn't necessarily look good. 
So it takes a little bit more work to do it. It takes a little bit more risk to do it, but at the same time, you can get uh, well rewarded. Breaking the grids. So grids always should provide your base, but don't be afraid to break the grid intelligently. And what I mean by that is sometimes your grid module is too small and you want the paragraph to span two grids. Go ahead and span two grids. Your image, you want that image to span. That's fine. If you find yourself constantly breaking the grid, because the grid's never right, oh, I need more space here, I need more space here, well, chances are you don't have the best grid in the first place. So go back and revisit what the grid should be. But don't be afraid to break it. Sometimes the best spaces, and I always use architectural analogies, is you walk in and there's a column grid and you're walking through the column grid and then suddenly there's a column gone. It's missing. That becomes the focal point of the room, intuitively. You just gravitate toward that place because there's something missing. And so you can use that to your advantage here as well. So if you break it intelligently, you can get good results. So let's talk a little bit about the interaction of visual elements. One of the key things when we're starting to work on a poster is establishing a clear hierarchy for your visual um, pleasure, so to speak. So we know what to look at first, we know what to look at second, we know what to work at, look at third, and that has entirely to do with you as the designer picking what content is most important, second most, third most. So we're ranking that uh, important content. We're leading the viewer through a logical and meaningful journey as they view this particular page. Hierarchy should be, if the hierarchy isn't established, the eye tends to get distracted and move on. So if we, if we catch the hierarchy, we'll get through the whole document. If we don't, we tend to say, oh, there's too much going on, and we, we move. So let's look at this poster blown up. So if I asked all of you, what's the most important thing on this, this portfolio, or this poster? I'd say it's National Portfolio Day. Would you agree with me? So that would be ranked as number one. What's number two? It's kind of a toss-up. It could be the date, or it could be that the college, California College of the Arts is hosting. So we'll say that the date is number two, and this is number three. You could flip-flop those, and I'm okay with it. Okay. What's number four? It's probably whatever this text is down here. I don't know. Number five is probably that blue text. Number six is whatever on earth it's going on at the bottom there. So we can tell visually, based on this poster, what's most important, what's second, third, fourth, etc., because of the hierarchy that's been set up. So National Portfolio Day, biggest text in white against the black background, it jumps out, that's number one, clearly. Then number two, like I said, is a little bit um, iffy as to whether it's two or three. You could flip-flop the two. But that's the date and who's hosting it. And the text is a little bit smaller, it's in yellow, it doesn't stand out quite as much, but that's clearly the secondary uh, and tertiary element. Then we work our way down in size and color, then we work our way down in size and color again, and finally we work our way down yet again in size and color. So we've established that hierarchy very clear, this is what we look at first, this is what we look at second, this is what we look at third. I like to refer to this kind of as a 12, 6, 3, 1 rule. And I think it's a good way of explaining it. And I'm purposely walking to the very back of the classroom right here because I think it helps explain it, my concept. So whenever we have a poster, and I'm going to blow this one up so that it's bigger here, whenever you have a poster, and it could be something like this National Portfolio Day poster, but it also could very easily be um, you know, a presentation that you're putting on the wall. You're, you've got your, your final presentation, you've got all your drawings, you put them up on the wall, somebody's coming in to review, same thing applies here. And the idea behind this is that there should be something that you can gravitate toward and be interested in from far away. So obviously I'm much further than 12 feet away from this particular poster in this scenario, but I can clearly see as I'm standing right here, National Portfolio Day. Like, that's, that's blatantly obvious. That's my number one hierarchy. I can see it from far away. Now, if I imagine taking half the distance from where I'm standing here, walking toward my poster, and I stop at that halfway point, I should now see something new, interesting, and unique that I couldn't see from back there. That keeps me interested. So I'm moving my way up into something else that's interesting. It doesn't work as well on, on a projection like this because, obviously, uh, it's projected. It's not a physical thing. 
So once I'm here and I find something new and interesting, I should be like, oh, I want to get half the distance closer again. And when I get that next halfway point, I should see something else new and something else interesting. And then I go half the distance, and before too long, I'm right up against it, and I should see something really unique and interesting here that I couldn't see at any one of those other distances. That's what makes a very good, engaging presentation. And for those of you that have done these kinds of reviews, you worked in studio class, and you put up a review, uh, and you had visiting reviewers come in, the best thing that you can have is for a reviewer to actually get up out of their chair and want to get close to something and stare at it. That's a good sign. You've engaged them. You've got them interested in what it is you're presenting. So if you always keep that in the back of your mind about what's it look like from across the room all the way up to what's interesting and unique right at the one foot when I'm up close looking at it, you're going to have a really quality presentation. And you're going to engage whoever it is in the room that's coming to look at it. So if we're trying to establish the hierarchy in the first place, we need to rank those elements by importance. So we kind of ranked them in the, the pre-existing posters. But if I asked you to do the lecture series poster, which of course I am asking you to do it, you could come through that same logic. What's the most important thing that I'm going to tell somebody on this lecture series poster? Probably that it's a lecture series. What's the second most important thing? Maybe where it is, what time it is, what day it is. I don't know. You come up with that part. What's the third most? Who's coming to speak? Maybe who's coming to speak is more important than any of the rest of it. You know, maybe Frank Geary's coming to speak. Maybe, I don't know, uh, you know, you name it. He's coming to speak. Maybe that's the most important thing. You know, I could care less what day or time it is. If Tom Main's coming to speak, I want to go watch him. That might be the most important thing. So you as the designer have to decide What's the most important thing that's going on the page? The, what's the highest in this hierarchy? And then what are the sub subordinate elements that need to go on the page? So once you've got that situated, you have an understanding of what it should really look like and what should be biggest, et cetera. Space is the other thing that's very important. If you have a, a poster that has, it's just completely covered with elements and there's no space around any of the elements, nothing has enough room to breathe, and suddenly you have a, a dead composition. It's the same thing that happens when we talked about the rule of thirds, where if you center, you know, you hike to the top of the mountain and you take the picture of the person and the person's in the dead center of the image. It deadens the space around it and becomes uninteresting. If you put them off center and you give a little bit more context, the space enhances the content. Same thing applies if it's a text element or if it's a photograph in an overall composition, not just within the photograph itself. The empty space brings the elements alive. So you want to focus on the negative space as well as the positive space. The space that's around the objects as well as the space of the objects. It's really important for the navigation of the eye and it directs you towards what's important. Actually, I really like this image because this, the, the, the dominant image, and I'd ask you guys to squint at it and look at it as well, the dominant piece of this particular composition is really this blank space right here. That's probably the most important, that's the highest ranking thing on this particular composition, is that blank space. It's so important that your eye gravitates toward that, and then you know where to start reading. So you look at that space first, and then you say, oh, master piece, oh, that's interesting, it's shot. Oh, it, it's up there, oh, and then I look at the rest of it. So it's a different way of looking at it, but it's geared around that space. When we're using space, if you group elements together, sometimes that can help focus your attention on one particular area. Remember that centering an object and equalizing the space around it negates the space and makes it uninteresting. Placing the object off-center creates a nice weighted asymmetrical composition, creates a little more activity. Don't have too much space either. So I put a blank piece of paper up here just so that I could illustrate this a little bit. But if, for example, I took and I put an image right here, number one, that image would be way too small for the size of the page. Number two, it's dead center, so all the space around it becomes inactive. 
and not useful. If I take the same size image and I put it down here, it's still too small, but it al already becomes a little bit more interesting because it's weighted, it's asymmetrical. Now if I take that same image and I correct the size and I say, you know what, it needs to be more like that, suddenly this starts to be a little bit more interesting as a composition. So just the placement of the element can make a really big difference overall. Scale can also be used to establish hierarchy. So we talked about this in the typography lecture, where just changing the font size, if you did nothing else and you took the font and you started with the heading at 18 point, the subheading at 14 point, right, the body text at 10 point, and the footer or the small text at 8 point, if you created that hierarchy with nothing else, that would be a hierarchy. So just changing the size of an element can be important. The other thing about it, though, is maintaining a consistency when you do it. So if you establish that it's 18, 14, 10, and 8, on every page in your portfolio, it should be the same 16, 14, 10, and 8, if that's what I said. I don't remember. But you guys get the idea. It should always be consistent page to page to page. So as you're developing this body of work, there's a framework for which you're working within. Quantity. Do you have too many elements? If you do, it could be cluttered or could have a lack of order because you have too much there. Make sure that all of the things on the page have a specific function. They're serving a specific purpose. The alternative to that is that you have too many or too few things and your page feels very empty because you just don't have enough content on the page. So you want to find that balance. And I think that one of the good ways of doing this is either using a subtractive method or an additive method to do this. And it really depends on how your brain works as to which way you tend to work. So the additive method is you start with a blank page and you put one thing on the page. And you say, is that enough? No, it's not enough. Let me put one more thing on the page. Now I have two things. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. I put three things on the page. Is that enough? Not quite. I put a fourth thing on the page. Is that enough? Oh, no, I think that's too many. Let's take the fourth off. Good. I like it with my three elements. The alternative is the subtractive method. Here's all the things I think I want to put on the page, and I put them on the page. And I say, oh, that's too cluttered. Let me take something away. Okay, it looks a little bit better. Let me take something else away. Oh, it looks a little bit better. Let me take something else away. Oh, that was too many things. Let me put it back. There we go. I like it. So you can work either way, but that's a brain thing. It depends on how you work and how you want to see it. And I'm not going to tell you which way I am, because I want you just to figure it out for yourself. Orientation and position. So this can lead to strong contrasts, which enhance that hierarchy, give you that focal point in the overall page. So for example, let's say all of your elements are horizontal in nature. If you introduce a vertical element, suddenly you've got contrast right there and it gives you that focal point. I actually, I really like this image and I'm going to blow it up in the next slide here because I think it's a great way of identifying the difference between a lot of horizontal and then one vertical. And it's working nicely with the text and the, the elements on the page itself. So if we look at this, right, the big contrast point is we've got everything going horizontally. All of these go horizontally, all that text goes horizontally. And we have this one strong vertical element here. And there's our flip of the text. So just by doing that, we've created that really strong center focal point in the overall composition. The only thing that bugs me is this is a idealist instead of an idealist. But that's, that's a side note. It just, just bugs me. But compositionally, this is really interesting uh, and well thought out. Depth, dimension, and perspective. So we've kind of gone away from this as a graphic design strategy. It was really trendy for a while. Um, and then we changed a bunch of things to be more in a flat UI trend. And that's, that's where we are. And when I say UI, I mean user interface. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Apple kind of led the way in changing how we're interacting with things and the kind of the visual uh, understanding of graphic design changed a bit. Anyway, um, we moved. It, it, if we want to add a perspective, this is essentially where we take elements and we put one in front of the other in front of the other, giving a sense of depth, even if it's artificial. Uh, that can be a way of kind of layering and telling you, hey, what's in front is more important than what's behind, which is more important than what's behind that. So we're using depth to do it rather than just straight hierarchy. 
I had to throw a slide in here about, about typography. Obviously, it's important if I spent a whole lecture talking about it. So it's very, very important in the nature of your graphic design. Don't forget to pay careful attention to it because it's its its, its own element. Make sure you pick the right font, all the things that we talked about last time. Also make sure you're thinking macro and micro scales. I mentioned this last class, what I'm in refresher, if you fell asleep during that part of my lecture, I mean think about the big picture stuff. What does the font look like as a whole? What does the text look like as a whole? But also all the way down to is the tracking right? Do I have the right amount of space between two letters on a heading? So we want to get small scale perspective, big scale perspective all at the same time. Color. Color is a unique one. Actually, it'll be devoted to an entire lecture. We'll talk just about color for a lecture. It provides a lot of visual interest, and it can be used to emphasize a specific element of your design. If everything else is in black and white and suddenly something's in color, guess what? That's important. Your eye naturally gravitates toward that particular thing. So it can be great to use just a little bit color. You can use a whole comprehensive color palette, a whole bunch of different colors, or you can just use one highlight color, and that highlight color is just enough. It depends on what you're trying to do. Consider the tone of design with regard to the color choice. Like I said, we'll spend a whole lecture talking about colors and color choice and why you might choose one color over another color. Obviously, you haven't had that lecture yet, so you're going to hang tight for a little bit. But uh, think about what, you, what color you're picking, essentially, is what I'm saying. Graphic shapes and linear elements. So these little shapes, these little designs, this is like the plus sign or the little line at the bottom or, or those kinds of things that fall into your graphic designs. They're designed to direct you toward the active areas of the page, much like uh, a margin would be used. The problem with these little graphic shapes, etc., is that often people to put too many of them on a page. And it ends up becoming very, very cluttered because you have too many of these little elements. It works nice if you have one line or one little plus sign, or something subtle to help direct your page. If it's too many, you're going to end up uh, running into problems. So in review, you as the designer need to create a hierarchy. That's huge. You need to order and control that design. Ideally, you're going to use some kind of contrast to establish a focal area. This is where I start viewing first. And then you use your compositional factors to support that design that you've been Invest. Okay, so we're going to start back up um, with the, the demo portion. Uh, today I asked you guys to work on a 4x6 version uh, of an architecture, industrial design program, postcard, lecture series, whatever. I don't really care so much about the content. It's just basically a small trial practice version so you have some, some practice with grid modules and uh, really we're going to concentrate on alignment tools and, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and in in design, I'm going to create a new document. And with this new document, first thing I'll do is change the units into inches because, like I said, picas don't mean anything to me. Uh, and then I'll change this to be 4 by 6. And so depending on my orientation, I can do 4 by 6 in uh, portrait mode or in landscape mode. It's, it's really it's up to you. Uh, we're, we're talking something in the neighborhood of like this. This might be 5 by 7, but that's that's the general category of what we're working with. So it's a little informational card, so to speak. So I have that at, at 4 by 6. I'm going to uncheck the facing pages box here because that is not necessary. It's not going to be a booklet. It's just going to be a single page. As a, that's fine. Portrait landscape doesn't make any difference. Uh, under margins here, I'm going to expand margins, and I'm going to set all of these to 0. And so you guys have seen me do that before. Um, just because I like to push them out of the way and then define the margins later on. Um, so I set all of those to zero. We're not going to talk today about bleed and slug, though we will talk about bleed next class and why it's important and, and what it's used for. So we're not going to worry about that too much. I'm going to go ahead and click on create. Uh, no columns? We're not talking about columns? We don't need to work on columns. We'll, we'll manually set them up. We don't need to set them up in the setup here. So now that I have this set up, I'll close that little preview window, and we're again looking at a blank page for me to start working with. And so the first thing that I'm really going to concentrate on is working with the frame tool and then kind of aligning elements together. So I have four inches across. Uh, if I were doing, for example, one inch squares, I wouldn't have any column intervals as I was going 
across. So I need a little bit of space. So rather than doing uh, a one inch square, I might do maybe, um, I don't know, let's say uh, three quarters of an inch and let's see what happens. So to create a square, because I'm going to work as squares, I've come over here to the left side, I've picked the frame tool. And with the frame tool selected, I will then click, rather than dragging and creating a box that way, I'm going to actually just single click and it will give me a rectangle dialog box that I could type in the values. So frequently this is a little bit uh, easier here and I could type in, for example, you know, 0.75 by 0.75 something like that, and then I could go ahead and say OK, and that gives me that square. If you want to change the page after, so when I first created it, it was in, um, it was in uh, portrait orientation. If I want to change that afterward, I would go to, I apologize, it's different on the Mac, so sometimes I have to, to find it again. It's File, Document Setup, and then you can change the orientation right there. OK, so I have my first little square there which actually seems way too small for content. So uh, let, me, let me increase the size here. It may take me a few tries to get this right here. Uh, let's do like uh, 1.25 by 1.25. I'll try to do three across. There's one. OK, so I have the first little square here. I kind of like that. I'm going to go ahead and create two more of these. I can do that by either copying and pasting, or I could just uh, click and create two more. I'm going to press Control-C to copy and Control-V to paste. That's going to give me my second. And then I'll press Control-V again. That's going to give me my third. And so now that I have these three, let's see if they even would fit across the page. Yes, they will fit across the page with a little bit of extra space. So when we start talking about alignment tools, we have some different alignment options that are built in to InDesign. And you've probably experienced some of these already. Uh, when you're moving an object, so I'm clicking and moving this, as I come down to match up with the object next door, you see that it tells me where there's a center line alignment, where it's aligning to the top and where to the bottom. So just by dragging, I get access to some of those alignment tools. I can get a little bit more specific, though, with these tools by opening up a window that's called the Align window. So if I go to Window, Object and Layout, and then choose to open the Align window, right there, we have some basic alignment tools. And these basic alignment tools work to justify objects to the left, to the center, to the right, to the top, middle, and bottom. And so if I had these three objects, and I wanted, say, this object and this object, to come up to match up with where that object is. I can select the three objects, and with those three objects selected, I now have to pick what they call the key object. So what is the object I don't want to move? So I don't want to move this object, so I'm going to click on that, single click, one more time, and it highlights that object. The highlight color in this scenario is blue, but that's because the layer itself is blue. The color of the layer is blue. Uh, so if my layer was red or purple or whatever, it would highlight in that color. But you can see that it's clearly highlighted. And I can then use my alignment tools over here to say align the top edges. And they're all going to jump up to align with that. So while I could take each one of these and pull it up until it aligned and pull this one up, in this scenario, because I'm aligning multiple objects to this one object, it's simpler to select all of them pick my key object, and align them all to that top edge. Now if I take, say, this object here, let me deselect them all, and I place this object at whatever I want it to be from the edge of the page. So this might be a time to reset where my margins were. So I can go back up into the document setup here. So I go to File, Document Setup. I can look at my margins and say, OK, now that I've kind of worked with it a little bit, I want my margins to be an eighth of an inch. Um, so there it is at 0.125 all the way around. I'll say OK. That then gives me an eighth of an inch all the way around. So I could say, OK, well, I know I want this object against that edge there. And I know I want this object over here against that edge there. Well, and of course, my objects are exactly the right size. <laughs> uh, let's, let me make those objects a little bit smaller. Hold on a second. Let me do. Uh,
All right, I just made those a little bit smaller so you can see this work. Okay, so let me take this object right there. I'm just going to copy and paste it. I'll put this one right here, and I'll put one more in the center here, like that. And now that I have those three, I could select those three. I could pick this as my key object. I could align the top edges. I have the left object positioned where I want it. I have the right object positioned where I want it. But I want this middle one to be centered in between the two. So in that scenario, I would say, OK, let me select all three. And I'm not picking a key object anymore. But I'm going to come down here to the Distribute Objects section. So I first worked with the Align Objects. I'm going to come down to the Distribute Objects. And I want to use this one, which is Distribute Horizontal Centers. And when I do that, it will move the center object to be evenly spaced within the two outer objects. So if we drop this in size even more so that I had four of these, so let's go to uh, hopefully this will give me four. OK, so I have four objects now. I'm going to actually, you know what, let me take this one and put it over here. Let me take this one and put it over here. Then I will take all of them together. I'll pick this as my key object. I'll align them all so that they're even at the top. And then I'll use the distribute objects, this one here in the center. Oops, sorry. It was because I had a key object. So get rid of there we go. So now I'll you distribute all along the horizontal center, and it will evenly space these two with the spacing the same all the way across. Question? The align box is available under Window, Object and Layout, Align. Can you leave it out? And so you can leave it out. You could even choose to dock it over on the side if you wanted to. Yeah. So all I did was I recreated them as a different size. I didn't scale them. We'll get to scaling in just a second. So when I created these boxes, essentially, I just went to the frame tool. Yeah. And on the first one, you changed the size after you I, de I deleted it and then recreated it. So we, I will talk about uh, the size in just a second. So anyway, um, so I have these. They're evenly distributed like that now. If I wanted another group of these, I could copy, I could paste, and now I have another group of these. I would need to work through the same kind of alignment strategies, though, in terms of how these would come together. Now, if I just said, oh, let me select this as well, I'll make that uh, my key object, and then I'll distribute them uh, you know, horizontally or whatever, I would end up kind of compressing them all together. However, if I took all of these like that and I group them, and I can do that by right clicking and saying group, it makes them kind of like one object. And I could then say take all of these, right click and group. Then I can work with these two with this whole thing being the key object, make sure I align to the left. And in this scenario, I don't have three of them, so I'm not distributing the space. I'm not distributing the object, but I could use this distribute spacing setup. This distribute spacing allows you to specify what you want the spacing to be. So I can say I want an eighth of an inch between them, 0.125. Distribute it so there's 0.125 between them, or maybe I want a sixteenth, 0.0625, and distribute those so that there's a sixteenth of an inch between them. If I were to take these and I were to uh, ungroup so that they were all individual, I could then say, let's take this one as my key object, and I could distribute the spacing so that they're all a 16th there. Picking that as my key object, and I could distribute the spacing between them so that they're all a 16th. So you see, I can kind of work through this as a setup. And so I can quickly start to evolve a grid, a multiple column grid. Um, so for our purposes today, I'm not really concerned with creating the perfect layout. So what I create here isn't the model. It's just teaching you the various techniques. And then you guys can take it from there in terms of how you want to lay it out. Um, if I wanted to, to keep these 
the spacing up here closer, right? I can, of course, select these objects and I can move them up. I could also group them. Control G will group. I could group these, Control G, and then I could use that distribute spacing again between them. They're both selected, and I could say I want to use a spacing of, oh, I don't know, um, oops. Like that. Ah, that's too much. Let's go 0.125. Yeah, maybe like that. Do you guys get how I'm kind of working through this? Now, this is an example here where this edge, the ungroup, this piece really needs to be over so that it lines up there. But then I would want these to be distributed, so I'd select them again and then use this upper distribute objects along center so that the spacing would be even there. So I'm kind of working my way uh, between and among the various options here. Let me go ahead and right click and group these. Let's take this one, right click and group those. Select both of these. And then we'll use the, that as the key object, we'll distribute. Sorry, I should have used the distribute spacing instead. There we go. And there it is. Likewise, this one needs to go over, so let me ungroup it. I'll right click and say ungroup. That's my key object. We'll align those to the right, and then we'll take these and distribute the spacing along the horizontal center. So you kind of see how I'm working my way around and manipulating these. A big part of today is, is feeling comfortable with this manipulation of your of your boxes. So I've gone ahead and I've manipulated those. Now with any one of these, I could of course place an object or an image into it. So I could take this image, let me uh, ungroup these. Good, they're all individuals now. Let me right click and say ungroup. And I could say, okay, I want this object and I'm gonna place an image in it. So I'd go to file and then place. Which of course I can't see, there we go. It's also control D is the keyboard shortcut. Let me go into today's folder. There we go. And I could drop any one of these images into it like that. Uh, remember that we have the option to right click on the object and go to fitting and then fill frame proportionally so that we're filling the whole frame with our image. Okay. So if, for example, I wanted this same object to span all the way across, right? I could create another, I could even copy this, but um, let me go ahead and just copy this one. We'd come down here. I need to know what my spacing was between these. So if I took this and I took this, that's going to be my key object and I can use the distribute spacing so that my spacing was right. And then I could take this frame and I could make it span all the way across. And then I could take this and I could place that in. So I'd go to file and then place. And we could drop another image in like that. Right click fitting, fill frame proportionally like that. If, if I don't like how this image fits in the frame, remember I can double click on the image. It gives me kind of a light brown view of what the image is underneath the frame and I could then adjust what part of the image is, is shown. So I can pull that down a little bit so that I am not cutting off the top of the bridge in this scenario. Single click to get outside of that option. So that's dealing with the frames. You guys have done this already. But what happens if instead of spanning one frame, you want a single image to go across multiple frames? So I want to leave the divisions in between here, but I want one image to span across multiples of these. So I can do that. I'll do that with these four going, well, I'll do it with these, let's do it with all four, and I'll use the same strategy here. When I do this, I want to select the frames that I want to span across. So there's one, two, three, and four. So I've selected all four of those frames. I'm going to go up to the object menu. I'm going to go to the paths submenu, and I'm going to choose make compound path. So it's objects, paths, make compound path. 
When that happens, notice that the individual, the four X's that are shown on my frame, become one large X across that frame. Now when I go to place an image in, when I go to file and then place, I'm going to use the same image here, that image will span across those four. So I can right click and I can go to fitting, I can say fill frame proportionally, I could double click and move this down so we're not losing the top of the bridge, and now that image is spanning across the four rather than just one single image. Does that kind of make sense? So it works, I'm going to do, it, I'm going to do the thing again. Okay. So I would select my frames first, so this frame plus that frame there. I'd go up to Object, Compound Path, or excuse me, Object, Paths, Make Compound Paths. The X changes to a single X that spans across the two. I could then go to File and then Place, and I could drop in whatever image I want there. Right click, Fitting, Fill Frame Proportionally. And there we are. So I can basically I can span across these two frames. Make sense so far? Good. So the next question that people like to, to bring up is, well, what if I don't want this conventional grid? What if I want to go to one of those alternate grids and I want something that's a diagonal or whatever? So essentially, the way that InDesign works is if you can draw it, you can use it as a frame. So I'm going to go ahead and create another page here just because it's easier than deleting what I have, and I'm going to work on this page too. I'm going to set this one up as an alternate frame. Now, in order to create this frame, I need to draw a shape. So instead of using my uh, frame tool, I'm just going to go ahead and use the pen tool, which is right here, which lets me draw any shape that I want. So I'll click on the pen tool right there. We will spend a bunch of time in Illustrator very soon talking exclusively about the pen tool. You'll actually spend a whole day working on just the pen tool. So you'll feel very comfortable at the end of that. For right now, it may take you a little bit of practice working with it. The objects that I'm going to draw are straight line segments. Given that they're straight, it only takes some single clicks. So if I come over here and I want to start my diagonal, say right here, I'm going to make a single click. And then I'll come up to my next point, which would be, say, the end of my diagonal. Maybe it's going to go right to the edge of the page there. There. I'd come down, single click again. There it is. I'd come down to the bottom. Let's go more like that. I'd come to the corner. And I'd come back. And now when I hover over where I started, I get a little circle next to my tool. That means I'm going to close the shape. And now that shape, oops helps if I actually click on the, there we go. Now that shape is a nice closed shape. Now in this scenario, this shape that I just drew does not have the X in it. It doesn't show the frame like we did before. It can still be used as a frame, however. So it, it doesn't look the same as a frame, but it can still be used as a frame. It, it'll cut it. I'm going to do it in just a second. Couple other things to note. By default, it has given me a stroke color of black. So there's a line that goes around this that is black. If I don't want that stroke color to be applied, I need to come over to the stroke color and change the stroke color to be apply none, the little red slash, which takes away the color from this frame around the edge. So once I have this shape, I can go ahead and go to File and then Place. And I could drop in, let's say, this image. I could right click and go to Fitting. And I could say Fill Frame Proportionally. And now you can see that diagonal image. So if I were going to add some text to this, for example, I would need to create the same thing. So I'd use the Pen tool. And let's do the text on this side here. I'd start my text, let's say, right here. Oops. Somehow I ended up with a starting point way over there. Let's start fresh. Right there. I'll come up here to right there. I'll come down to right here. And I'll close my text box right there. So I've created another shape. Again, using that diagonal as a guide. If, by the way, you don't like, if you, if you don't like the spacing between these, you can use the white arrow which is called the Direct Select tool, 
to select an individual control point on one of these curves and you can then modify that particular shape. So I can get it to where it feels like it's an even spacing, right like that. Once again, I don't want there to be a stroke around it, a stroke color, so I'm going to choose Apply None so it has no stroke. And then I'll go to my Text tool this time, or I could place text into this. And I'll click inside of that shape, and then I would need to start typing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to Type and then Fill with Placeholder Text just so that it looks like I have something in there. If I take this text, it's obviously it's too big, so we'd go back into all the typography sections over here where we'd adjust character styles and paragraph styles and all of that sort of thing. Um, I just can't bear looking at it at 12 point in this size. We need it to be smaller. Uh, let me right click or let me go up to object and then, or text, type, fill with placeholder text again. There we go. So you can kind of see it. Okay, so it gives us kind of a little sense of this unconventional layout strategy. So the same thing works regardless of what kind of a shape you can draw. So I've done all of these as, as straight segments. If, if you're comfortable with the pen tool, you know that you can create curving segments. So I can create any shape that I want. Let's say something like that. I could once again apply none to it. And then I could go to file and then place. Right click fitting, fill frame proportionally, and I can create uh, anything. So any shape that I can draw can ultimately be a frame for a particular image. Question? How did you change it to curve? So curving, we'll get to this in the pen tool. So if it, if it feels too daunting, you don't have to worry about it. But the way that the uh, pen tool works is if instead of making a single click, so from one point to another, it's going to draw a straight line. If instead of making a single click, I click and hold and then drag, I can create the arc or the tangent line of the arc. Uh, and like I said, we'll spend a lot of time practicing uh, how you would go about creating that, that arc. So I'm not, I don't have an expectation that you would do curves, but I want you to be aware of how you would do it um, at this point. Okay, so I'm going to create another page. Yeah? Place text in that shape. You see how it looks in this? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I could instead, let me go to File and then Place. Let me find that. Word file. Sorry, it's um, came in at 16 point. So let's go down to like seven point. There we go. So I can have the the text in there. Uh, this obviously needs a font assigned to it. That's. OK, hold on one second. OK, let's say there. OK, so now the text is in that shape. So the frame can't have an image behind and text in the frame. So it would take two, two frames together to create that effect. So in this scenario, this one has the text in it. If I were to copy and paste it, I can go to copy. And then when I go to paste, there's a paste in place, which puts it in its exact same position, right? one on top of the other. I could then take the one that was behind. So if I right click and say select uh, next object below, it should select the one behind it. And then I could go to file and then place. And I could drop instead of the text, we could drop in that image behind it. But it would take two separate frames to do it. And you made the image more transparent so you can read the text. Yes. So all of the image effects, if you go over to, let me switch out of uh, the topography back into the essentials. Here we go. If I go back to properties, I can come over here and adjust the opacity of the image so that it would be lighter behind the text. So there really isn't a layer system like Photoshop has. There absolutely is a layer system. We haven't, we haven't gotten to the layer system too much. We'll, we'll cover that next class. However, let me, let me explain it for you uh, in advance. So if we go to uh, Window, and then we choose to show layers, there they are right there, everything is 
on a layer, it's on layer one. So unlike Photoshop, where each object is its own separate layer, no matter what you do to it, uh, in design you can have a layer with multiple doc or multiple frames, multiple objects on it. The system works the same way. So one object is on top. Uh, you know, if it's if it's higher in the layer stack, it's going to be on top of the object that's underneath it. Um, we can create a new main layer. So I could have layer two here and layer one, and I could take any one of these, so the text, for example, and I could move it up onto layer two. Oh, come on. Hold on, I've got multiple things selected. Let me. And I could move it up onto, oh, really? Doing such a nice job of letting me have access to it. There we go. Now it's up on layer two, so that's entirely separate from layer one. So I could turn all of layer one off and still have access. So there is a layer structure. I was going to explain all of that next class, but we'll go back through it again next class. It's not as critical as in Photoshop because everything, you still have access to the layers if you need to manipulate it, but typically in InDesign, you don't have as many layers. You have one or two layers and just all the objects live on one layer. Turn that back on. You look like you had a question. Oh, yeah. I was going to say you compound as a passive and then you can do the same for text. Well, essentially, when you chain the text together, when you click that little plus sign like we did before, that is compounding the, the, the frames together. Um, it's a good question. Let me jump back to my pages up here. And I think if you were to take these frames and, and uh, go to object, paths, compound path, make compound path, and then we're to place text in. In 12 years, nobody's asked me that question. Uh, yes, so this would work so that the text, it might be confusing because it wouldn't read like a column, but uh, let me go back to properties here. Hold on, let me just. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to potentially jump that diagonal image. Right. So, um, yeah, if you wanted to jump the diagonal image, you could. So in this scenario, you can see that it, it goes across the frame, but this almost looks like a column, so it's a little awkward. But in that scenario, maybe it would work. I mean, you can play around with it. The other option in, in something like that would be to have your text box. Let me jump to this page here would be to have a single text box that went across and then to use your uh, text wrap to wrap around the object, um, which might be a little bit easier than setting up separate boxes. So it's just, it works more in the typography section than in this. It's, it's just a different strategy. Okay, so another thing that people ask is what about placing, what about placing an image inside of text? So if I take my text tool and I create a letter, so let's say I'll use the letter uh, G. And I make that letter big enough here. All right, something like that. I can convert this text into an object. So I can go up to uh, type and I could say create outlines. Now when I do this, I'm not going to be able to edit the text anymore. So you have to make sure the text says what it, you want it to say without like spelling errors or whatever. But I can create the outline from the text, which essentially makes an object out of the letter. And I can then go to file and place, and I could drop an image where that text would be. So you have the ability to do that as well. So like I said, any object can be used as a frame. So in this scenario, I'm using the text as a frame to hold that object. Okay. Yeah, I'll do it again. So it's as simple as creating your text first. So I start with the text. Um, I don't know. Uh, let's do, uh, we'll do an A. Why not? Oh, that's fine. I'll write my last name. How about that? Uh, obviously, this is going to be a little bit smaller in its size. Let's go maybe to 150 and see. No. Nope. 
it's okay that it goes off the page. You guys get the idea, right? Uh, so I take this text. I have just the text box selected. I go up to the type menu and I say create outlines. So type create outlines. That then you can actually see it create little outlines around my object. Then I could go to file and then place and I could drop an image behind that text. So fitting fill frame proportionally and there it is. Okay, so it's just another another strategy. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, sometimes people want to have something fade. So you have it solid here but fades to nothing. You can do that using your properties. So I have my object selected over here under properties. I'm going to come down to this FX icon. And when I do that, I'm going to pick, these are things like drop shadows and whatever. Stay away from drop shadows. They never look good in design. They just don't. So in very rare circumstances, you might use that. However, uh, we can do a gradient feather. And what the gradient feather does is it says, OK, I want it to be solid here, and I want it to become transparent there. This little diamond up top chooses how much of it is solid before it feathers to being transparent. So this feathers toward the end. When I say OK, this is now going to start solid and become transparent toward the end. Just another thing that enough people have asked me to do that I'm going to tell you how to do it. OK, so one more time. I'll do it to this object. So I have this selected. In the properties, I'm going to choose this FX. I'll choose a gradient feather. And in the gradient feather here, I can choose how I want it to be applied, say about like that. I could also choose the direction if I wanted it. So for example, I could have it radial so it could start solid in the center and then fade out all the way around. I'd say OK, and it would fade out as it goes around. I don't know that in that scenario it's the right use of it, but you guys get the idea. Make sense? OK, so I'm going to let you guys work through this. I'm going to let you play around with it today. Remember about all the things that I was talking about, creating a hierarchy. Uh, as you start to, to work through it. But today is really about playing with these various techniques. Make sure you understand how to make a compound frame where you have multiple objects and you span across them. Um, if you find that you don't like your design or your page, you can always come to pages and create a new page and start again and keep working. You can copy objects between pages. So remember, if you copy and then you go to paste, you can choose paste in place and it will show up in the same place on the next page. So if I liked this, up here, let's say that I liked, uh, I don't know, I like these objects here. I could go to Edit, Copy. I could create a new page down at the bottom here, and I could say Edit, Paste in Place. They'll show up in the same spot on this page, and then I could work from here. So if you like something, you can do it that way as well. So I think that.